Hello and welcome. My name is Molly Silberberg and I organize BAM's Humanities Programming. Thank you so much for joining us this morning and for your patience. Since its founding in 1861, BAM has hosted some of the most incisive voices of the moment, including presidents, activists, visionary thinkers, and artists. BAM has long served as a gathering place for critical ideas and conversation. In this pivotal and divided moment in our history, it is all the more essential to hear from those who give us new language and frameworks for understanding how we've gotten to where we are and to listen deeply to the creative voices who help bring wholly into the light the structures and dynamics of power that have long shaped our nation. This morning, we're truly honored to be hosting two brilliant minds and incredible storytellers, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Isabel Wilkerson and Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Lynn Nottage. They take as their starting point Wilkerson's deeply researched and immersive book Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, a New York Times bestseller, an Oprah book club pick, among many other accolades. It's an eye-opening story of people and history and an examination of what lies under the surface of ordinary lives in America today. Time Magazine writes that Cast is a transformative new framework through which to understand identity and injustice in America. And oh, the Oprah Magazine states, Cast offers a forward-facing vision, bursting with insight and love this book may well help save us. Wilkerson and Nottage began their conversation earlier this summer in an interview for Glamour, and I'm grateful to be able to host the continuation of their discussion today. A couple of logistical notes. We will have some time for questions as the discussion unfolds, so please feel free to post any questions in the chat. BAM has a zero tolerance policy for hateful language, and we will be monitoring the chat accordingly to enforce the community guidelines that are posted. And you can purchase a signed copy of CAST at a 15% discount today through Sunday through the link in the description and chat using the code BAMFALL. On that page, you'll also find links to Lynn Nottage's work, as well as Wilkerson's The Warmth of Other Suns. Please note that only CAST is eligible for discount at this time. And now to briefly introduce our guests. Isabel Wilkerson's first book, The Warmth of Other Suns, The Epic Story of America's Great Migration, won the National Book Critics, Critics Circle Award, the Linton History Prize, the Heartland Award, and was a finalist for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. It was named one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times, USA Today, O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, and many others. In 2019, Time Magazine named The Warmth of Other Suns to its list of the 10 best nonfiction books of the decade. Wilkerson is the first African-American woman to win the Pulitzer Prize in journalism and the first African-American to win for individual reporting. In 2016, Bar President Barack Obama awarded her the National, Medal, National Humanities Medal for her masterful combination of intimate human narratives with broader societal trends and for championing an unsung history. Lynn Nottage is a playwright and a screenwriter and the first woman in history to win two Pulitzer Prizes for drama. Her plays have been produced widely in the United States and throughout the world. Her plays include Floyd's, Sweat, Malima's Tale, By the Way, Meet Vera Stark, Ruined, Intimate Apparel, Fabulation or the Reeducation of Undine, Crumbs from the Table of Joy, Las Meninas, Mud River Stone, Poor Knockers and Poof. Musical librettos include The Secret Life of Bees and MJ, which is upcoming. She has also developed This is Reading, a performance installation in Reading, Pennsylvania. Ms. Nottage is the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant Fellowship, among other awards, and is an associate professor at Columbia University School of the Arts. It is my pleasure to turn over the stage to Isabel Wilkerson and Lynn Nottage. Thank you for the, that introduction and good morning to everyone. And hello, Isabel. I'm just so thrilled that I get another opportunity to chat with you. As you know, I found your book cast to be simply revelatory. You know, I, I love the specificity and the nuance of the storytelling. And in particular, the way that you interwove your personal narrative throughout the book, which gave me such um, a visceral access 
And um, I found it incredibly persuasive. You know, having this language right now in a, a, in a moment like this, it really has helped me um, decode what's happening in our country and the way in which we're fracturing along um, racial lines. Um, we, when we last spoke, um, we were leading up to the election and there was this great anxiety that was hanging in the air over us. And now, thankfully, we're on the other side of that darkness. And just to set the stage for our conversation, I was wondering whether you could describe for us the caste system, which I know you divide into eight pillars. And it's a really different way of thinking about our social hier hierarchy and our culture right now. Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say how happy I am to be here with you uh, today. I'm just thrilled to be able to continue our conversation. I just so love what we were doing before, and uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you. Um, yeah, we, we as the country, have inherited uh, a, a caste system, a hierarchy that goes back to uh, the colonial times, uh, at, at the time at which there were basically a bipolar structure that was created with the colonists setting themselves up as a dominant group uh, of uh, uh, essentially uh, exiling uh, those who were the indigenous people, uh, uh, decimating their numbers, and then of course bringing in um, uh, Africans, transporting Africans to build this new world, this new country uh, out of wilderness. And so thus set in motion uh, a 400 year old hierarchy that we are still uh, living under the shadow of to, to this current day. And, and the idea of caste is essentially allowing us to have new language, a new way of seeing beneath what we think we know about our country, being able to see the infrastructure of, of our divisions, the origins of our divisions, the origins of our discontents, being able to have language that allows us to focus in on structure as opposed to feelings and emotion, emotions of guilt and shame and blame, but, all, but looking beneath what we think we can see. I often describe, you know, the, the, this work that I have emerged with um, as kind of an x-ray of our country. And uh, that x-ray shows us that we have um, an underlying infrastructure of division, uh, caste system, um, and in, in our caste system, um, race becomes the tool, the signifier, the cue as to where one is positioned or assigned in that caste system. You know, how, uh, what one can do, where one is expected to be, what kind of occupations we are considered to have been um, uh, uh, assigned, um, and, and, and how we're treated in, in every sphere of, of the system, from uh, the medical field to, uh, you know, to just criminal justice system, to how we are, are treated or engaged or seen uh, by the authorities. And so essentially a caste system is an artificial, arbitrary, graded ranking of human value in a society. That's essentially what a caste system is. And that, that, that graded ranking determines one's standing, um, the respect that you are accorded, the benefit of the doubt that you are accorded or that's withdrawn from you, um, access to resources or denial of access to those resources, assumptions of competence and intelligence and beauty even. So these are the things that um, are uh, assigned or seen um, that are instantaneous uh, impulse and recognition of where one is, uh, how one is seen as in a, in a society through no fault of our own. I mean, these are, it has nothing to do with one's actions or anything that you have to do. You're born to a group that has been historically assigned a place in the caste system, a place in the hierarchy, and we are still living with the after effects to this day. You know, it's so interesting. You were talking about just the ramifications of the caste system. And last time we spoke, I shared with you a, a, a story of like the personal impact of the caste system. Um, it was a story that was related to me by my both my grandmother and my my mother. My my mother grew up in in Crown Heights in the nineteen forties and and fifties and and sixties, and she lived with her mother and her and her grandmother. And my grandmother suffered a heart attack one day when she was coming home from shopping in the vestibule of their house. And my 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 mother was told to run across the street to the white doctor and um, ask him for help. My, my mother did that. She begged and pleaded for this white man to come to help her. And he refused to step into the house because she was a black woman. And my, my great grandmother who was in her early fifties died right there. You know, and you think about just all of the implications of of, of, of that act. You know, it, you know she, she died because she was a black woman and not seen as worthy of care. 
Absolutely. I mean, that is that is such a um, you know tragic and and um, you know gut wrenching example of the stakes that are involved when you have a caste system. We, you know, the idea that one is, uh, um, upon seeing an individual, um, those who have an investment in upholding the hierarchy, those who have absorbed the messaging of the hierarchy, make autonomic assumptions as to whether a person has value, whether a person is worth doing, uh, helping. And, and this is a life and death matter uh, that, that, that um, we live with even to this day. I mean, um, there are so many empirical studies that have shown that people in the medical field, even to this day, as educated as they may be, um, harbor unconscious biases that, um, that uh, allow uh, um, false assumptions that persist about brown and black people to this day. There are empirical studies that show that the unconscious biases uh, um, mean that uh, medical uh, professionals still believe, many of them still believe that black and brown people experience pain yeah. at a lower threshold. In other words, they don't experience pain in the same way that their white counterparts do, that white patients do. I mean, this is com a complete falsehood, but the idea that this has persisted to the current day is in some ways a through line from what you have described that happened to your great grandmother. Right. You know, her life cut short because of assumptions of her value on the basis of her positioning in a caste system. You know, it's so interesting. In your, um, in your book, you talk about the pioneering um, gynecologist whose name I either can't remember or have totally blocked out for, <laughs> for reasons who did experimentation on um, um, in, enslaved women because of this assumption is that they didn't feel pain. And a lot of times they were, they were operated on without any anesthesia. And um, they were subjected to some of the most hideous forms of torture in the name of science. Heinous, heinous. And in some ways, um, you know, um, all women um, of the current era, you know, owe a debt to those women who suffered so much as experiments um, for this, you know, really, um, you know, evil, evil, um, I don't even think the word physician is, is, is appropriate to, to call him, but that's what he was viewed as time and he did these heinous um, experiments uh, on women um, merely to be able to because he had access to them he I mean he, he had the right to do it uh, there was no protection for them and some of the things sadly did lead to some um, some breakthroughs but look at the cost the price yeah. that was paid as a result of that he withheld anesthesia now anesthesia was not as far along as it is now but what they did have, he withheld it from them purposely because he felt he, that they didn't deserve it, that they didn't need it. Um, this is an example of, of the differing ways that people were treated on the basis of their perceived value in a caste system. And just to in, in interject a little optimism into this conversation, and I could be totally wrong about this, but this election in some ways feels like it was a referendum on the caste system. You know, you think about Trump's slogan, make America great again, and it really um, harkened back to a time when the caste was so deeply entrenched in this culture and was exploited with, with impunity by those who were what you call the dominant caste. And, you know, I think about how optimistic we were when Obama was elected and now with Biden and Harris, um, there is like another dose of optimism, but we know that racism isn't going to in instantly disappear. And um, even though it may, we may have a sense that we're on this brave and bold new tra trajectory, but we know that it's going to take a long, long time. And I'm wondering now that white supremacy has been called out in such a direct and unapologetic way in the last few months. Do you think that we will now be able to have an authentic and direct conversation about the caste system and how it defines our culture. Well, I certainly hope that um, that we do. I mean, the impulse to rank and to categorize people is a, is sadly a, a deeply human uh, impulse um, among groups that feel that they want to control and subjugate others. And because this has gone on for so long in this country and has such long tentacles going back for 400 years, it's not, you know, no one election is going to, or one act or one individual um, is sufficient to overcome 400 years of a, of a hierarchy that's so deeply embedded that it's autonomic. I and mean, when you think about the examples that um, we have seen in, in recent um, years of 
just everyday intrusion of caste where you, know, you have two men um, at a Starbucks waiting for a friend and someone finds that uh, suspicious and they call the police on them. Right. Um, or a, a bird watcher in, you know, in Central Park who notices that there's a dog running loose or that's loose and he, he um, tells the, the owner and then she calls the police on him, thus endangering his life. Right. And these are not spaces where this would be viewed as overt um, you know, racism of our forefathers era. And yet it's the impulse to keep people in a fixed place. It's impulse to maintain hierarchy, to police boundaries and to police people who had been subjugated. So it's so much deeper than anyone. It's not just the politics. It's not just the laws. It's, it's, in, it's in the you know, hearts and minds and the autonomic responses of people who have been, who have been programmed. You know, too many, many, too many of us have been programmed to um, see the world in this way. It's hard to avoid the messaging that we get from you know, all spheres of life. And so this is so much bigger than any one year, any one uh, campaign, any one election. And I would hope that this would open our eyes to what we, actually, what we have to deal with. I mean, one of the things that, that I you know, became aware of in the process of working on this book, I made many, many trips to, to Berlin. I, mean, I traveled to the UK, I traveled to India. And in Berlin, um, in the middle of a major um, major world city is a massive, massive installation. It's several football fields wide, and it's in the middle of a major, um, you know, world city. And what that is is it's a it's a it's a memorial to those who perished in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And um, it's necessary. It's important. It's massive. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's massive. It. No. And the thing about it is that it there is no signage. There's no exhibition that describes what it is. Um, to give you the history of it. And the re one of the reasons why there, it isn't is because it's not necessary. Everyone there um, from, you know, from the earliest time that they're able to understand in school, young children, are, they, they are schooled and educated on what happened uh, in World War II. And so that everyone is on the same page about what happened. That doesn't mean that everyone agrees politically. It doesn't mean that, that everything is perfect, but it means that they are on the same page about basic aspects of the country's history. And we are far, far from that. We, we are not in agreement about basic, basic aspects of our country's history. We're not in agreement about the causes of the Civil War. We're not in agreement about the um, efficacy or purpose of Reconstruction. We're not, people are not even aware of what, what Jim Crow actually was. I mean, after the first book that I wrote, The Warmth of the Sons, which was about the, the great migration of people fleeing a caste system of the South, um, people would say to me, they had no idea. I mean, people don't realize that that was not just about water fountains and restrooms. I mean, it was against the law for a black person and a white person to merely play checkers together in Birmingham. There was, in courtrooms throughout the South, there was actually a black Bible and an altogether separate white Bible to swear to tell the truth on in court. In other words, the same sacred object could not be touched by hands of different races. That's how extreme and how specific and how deeply, deeply policed the boundaries were. So it was so much more than what we might think it was. But many people after the book came out said to me, I had no idea. I heard from people of all backgrounds, people whose lives intersected with the timeline of the book said, I had no idea this happened in our country. I had no idea this happened in my lifetime. And, and the, the fact of the matter is not having an idea has consequences. I mean, it, it, it has consequences in one's actions when you don't know basic, basic facts in history of one's own country as to how we got to where we are. You know, it's it's so interesting listening to you talk. We talk we talk about how we don't know our history, but I also think that there's this real unwillingness to know the history. You know, it's like a transgression on the part of a large, you know, of the 70 million people who who know that to embrace that history really means interrogating their own actions in ways that they're not prepared to do. You know, and I, you also think about sort of the absurd and extremes that white people have gone to to reinforce the caste system. You were talking about it's like Plessy versus Ferguson, you know, the separate but equal, one drop laws, redlining, voter suppression, and just this endless and diabolically imaginative ways that they have denied, you know, rights to the subordinate caste. And I, I, I just think it's it's fascinating. It's, it's fa fascinating. And one of the things that I was curious about in, in your book that you you mentioned is that um, whiteness is a, a construct. And I would love for you to talk about just the notion of, of, of whiteness and when did it arise and why are people clinging to it like with, 
you know, with every ounce of their energy, they refuse to let go of whiteness. Yeah. Well, you know, but, but, uh, the idea of race as we know it now is really only four or 500 years old. It only, you know, in terms of human history, it's fairly new concept. Um, it only dates back to the time of, you know, essentially exploration of uh, by Europeans of the, you know, the world outside of themselves. Um, it only had meaning. It only, it only uh, was became a phenomenon uh, by which to identify and characterize people um, during the time of the transatlantic slave trade, as pe as the colonists were um, creating this caste system in the New World, and. Um, as they were creating the, this hierarchy, um, which was based upon what people looked like ultimately. And that meant that anyone who was arriving to this caste system, arriving to this, to what was then the, co the colony, um, had to figure out where they fit in. In other words, what how to navigate this world. And it turned out upon arrival, they might have been identifying themselves as Irish or Polish or Hungarian. I mean, back where they were from, the idea of identifying oneself by skin color or phenotype would have had no meaning because they were surrounded by people who look like themselves. The same goes for, for other parts of the world. Um, in in Sub-Saharan Africa, the you know skin color would not have been the primary identifying characteristic one would identify in terms of ethnicity. Um, and, and you know, if you were Irish or, or Hungarian, you identified yourself in that way or family lineage. I mean, there, there are many, many ways, but whiteness or being black race was not the primary identifier. But when people came, uh, you know, you have this confluence of people um, who are from different parts of the planet who happen to look different in a su superficial way, that became the primary identifier. So the people who are arriving who are Irish or Polish or Hungarian or Ukrainian, whatever that might've been, were then um, identified by something that they never would have identified themselves before. They became part of the dominant group. They were assigned to the dominant group and they were identified and given a new characteristic to, um, to see themselves as, and that would be white. And because, whiteness carried with it the dominant caste privileges and entitlements that were that were built not not this is not just feelings this were built into the laws you know uh, the laws that determined who could own land who could do what um the laws that determined you know where people could live um who could get a mortgage you know generations later who could get a mortgage uh, those kinds of things became uh became measurable um advantages and distinctions that that gave people a sense of standing by birthright. And that's something that's very difficult to let go of when, once you have come to believe this to be the laws of nature, which they are not. This is a social construct created by man, created by human beings, and thus it could be uh, dismantled by human beings if there's the will to do so. And to see the, common, the commonality um, across these manufactured divisions. You know, when you talk a little bit about like the extremes that folks want to um, to um, possess white privilege. You know, I'm thinking in, in terms of the middle caste and how Chinese and Indian folks at the, you know, in the late 19th century and early 20th century actually went to court to try and declare themselves white in order to access that privilege. Just, um, it's just stunning. There are so many court cases in which they, and, and in an interesting way, I mean, they were also interrogating the um, the manufactured uh, characteristic anyway. I mean, they were they were challenging the fact that this was a social construct. I mean, one one of the one of petitioner to the Supreme Court indicated that he was Japanese, but that his skin was actually whiter than the so-called white people who had had the privilege of being able to identify themselves as white. His his uh, petition was re was rejected. These are people who were attempting to gain citizenship by by in by um, appealing to the courts as as white people. I mean, also they were they were challenging the the arbitrary nature of designating who could be what on the basis of color. Um, there also is this you know the the idea that that, that the word Caucasian actually comes from um, an 18th century German physician who happened to have used that term. Caucasian from the Caucasus only because he, he he was someone who collected skulls and he had all these different skulls from around the world and the skull that he deemed the most beautiful happened to have been from the Caucasus and so because of that 
he identified that as the, the superior race, superior group of which he identified himself. In other words, he also assigned himself to the superior group, even though he was not from the Caucasus, he was from Germany. And so that's how the word Caucasian came to be. So Caucasian, all of these things are absolute creations of human beings, you know, centuries ago that then became accepted as the laws of nature when actually these are all social constructs that have no meaning or basis in science and were arbitrary to begin with. I know it's sort of the randomness and the ar arbitrariness of it and that the way in which it's imprinted on all of us is, is actually quite painful to, to contemplate. And you know, you so beautifully articulate something in your book that I experienced firsthand when I was working on my play Sweat, which is about um, the way a community, a multicultural community fractures um, when they lose their livelihood. And I conducted a lot of interviews when I was in Reading, Pennsylvania, in particular with a lot of the white working class. Um, and what I found is um, just under the surface when you began to really push them that what they were most frustrated about wasn't that they were losing their economic status, it's that they were losing their white privilege. And you could see how that really was eating and gnawing away at them. And there's something in your book that you say, um, which really resonated with me is white skin, white supremacy was spiritual nourishment. And Trump really took advantage of that and the white middle class and their fragility, um, didn't he? And their dependency on what you say is like this illusion of white superiority, which is built into this caste system. Um, and I don't know that there's embedded a, qu a question in, in there, but I, um, but it's an observation that I definitely had and I didn't have the language to talk about it in, in, until I read your book. It's like, yes, this is exactly what I experienced it. But one of the other things that I found and, I, and and perhaps this is the question that um, um, is that mm -hmm. there was a real wedge that was um, put between white and black workers who in some cases worked on the same floor, you know, were of the same economic class and should in theory be allies. But, you know, once they, they found themselves in this economic hardship, you know, the white supremacy re reared its ugly head. And I was wondering whether you could talk just a little bit about that wedge. Yeah, I mean, one of the examples, of course, is was out of New York uh, during the draft riots um, uh, during the time of the Civil War, in which you had um, Irish immigrants who had who were newly arrived to this country and were in the same, you know, facing the exact same challenges as the as the uh, as African Americans uh, who they were working side by side with, who they often were living in the same, um, you know, tenements uh, with, and merely because of, in some ways, this was because of the way that the caste system worked, is that it actually um, direct, was drafting um, these newly arrived immigrants to fight in a war that had not been their war, they had not created, they just arrived, and then would not work, were, were, the, the, the system actually did not permit, at that time, the time of the draft rides, um, African Americans, Black people, uh, they were not drafting them, they were drafting um, the Irish immigrants. And that means that was a way that the wedge was created in that era. In a, decades later, um, decades later, it turned out that unions would, would allow the recently arrived immigrants to, uh, to, be, to put, be part of unions, to be able to be protected by unions. And then they would bring in uh, the uh, newly arrived African-Americans from the South. And who, those who had arrived as part of the Great Migration, they would bring them in as strike breakers, so that in, in every uh, at every turn there were there was a a um, policy or legal wedge that was created that was inserted uh, that was uh, that had the effect of distancing people who would have otherwise had you know much more in common because they were kind of the same people. They were many of them had had come from far away, left their families uh, to come to a, a, a forbidding, uh, you know, competitive place, a new world, and found themselves trying to manage, uh, survive in that world. And they were often working side by side. And then there were these wedges that were inserted to keep people apart. And so that's the way that, um, you know, that the entitlement was assigned, accorded to one group purely on the basis of what they look like. And then that, that were denied to other group the, another group, purely because of what they look like. You were allowed into the union on the basis of what you look like. And that's one of the reasons why I use this language because it allows us to look past 
what we think we see, the language that can obscure the what's underneath it. Because race is really yeah. what you look like. In our country, that's the main dividing line. And, and if that's the basis, I mean, this is taking a, a, you know, a, a neutral characteristic that should have no meaning other than that is just the part of the variation of human um, physical presentation and turning that into an indelible essence of value of the individual and uh, assumptions of, of you know, competence and intelligence and uh, resourcefulness, all the various things. And so that's the danger of what we're looking at. And that's why I think it's really important to look beneath what we think we see. And we do need new language to recognize that this is all a construction. Well, and speaking of policies that are used to distance people, um, how has immigration been used in a, a tool um, in the caste system, you know, I'm thinking about the way in which Trump has incited his base around issues of immigration, you know, the wall, um, separating families, his overall sort of harsh and intolerant stance and the language that he's used is so, so clearly coded. And so I'm wondering whether you can just uh, um, talk a little bit about, yeah, um, how, you know, immigration was used as a tool going all the way back to the founding fathers. I mean, this is not something that's new, you know, it just, it, it just evolves. And yeah, definitely- well, the, you know, in the originating, <laughs> just uh, <laughs> when the country originated, um, there was the, the definition of who could you know, immigrate to the country was, you know, was based, was white, you know, free white persons. That was what, the, that was what the country was built for. Literally, that was what the country was built for. Literally, that was the definition of who could be an American. And in the, you know, the century since that time, immigration has been one of two main ways of curating the American population, a way of, of bolstering the dominant group, the dominant caste when it felt necessary, of excluding those who would not be uh, permitted in the dominant caste, um, and, and the, you know, the, um, to, to our point about, you know, the definition of, of who could be white, um, for much of our country's history, people that we identify without question as being white now were um, in previous centuries at the, the uh, end of the, the 19th century and the early 20th century were not viewed as white. People who were from Eastern and Southern Europe were viewed as provisional. Um, the 1924 Immigration Act worked to limit the numbers of people who could come from those parts of Europe. So it has always been a contested, um, mutating definition of who could be identified as being in the dominant group. Another way that the, that um, our, our caste system has used to curate and control the population is what's called endogamy, which is one of the hallmarks of a caste system. Endogamy meaning who can marry whom, keeping marriage only uh, within relationships uh, and childbearing presumably only within the, the a particular group, a particular caste. And so much of our country's history, in, a, in fact, for longer than it has not been the case, um, the, the, the castes, as I described in the United States, were strictly uh, forbidden to marry across caste li- what I call caste lines. And it wasn't until 1967 that um, anti-miscegenation laws were ruled unconstitutional by the, by the Supreme Court. But until that time, the majority of the states had at one time or another uh, um, strict laws prohibiting marriage across what we call racial lines and which, what I would call caste lines. Um, and that means that for longer than it has not been the case, uh, people were not le- permitted to legally um, marry across cl- caste lines um, and thus childbearing across caste lines were viewed as, was viewed as, as um, illegitimate. And, and what that does is it, it forms, it's, it, comes the way that you create the very so-called races and castes that we're describing because people had no choice um, but to um, but to but to marry within their caste lines and that becomes a way of curating um, the society of course we know that the great breach of that occurred during enslavement when um, enslaved women um, were um, br- you know brutalized and and raped and thus that creates yet another potential wedge within the subordinated group, which which looks looks the way that it does because of massive, massive um, sexual abuse at the hands of 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 uh, enslavers, of enslaved women. You know, it's it's and I and correct me if I'm wrong, but misogynation laws in Alabama were overturned in 2000 and 40 percent of the people voted against it, which I find astonishing. <laughs> Forty percent, forty percent of voting in Alabama 
voted to keep the anti-miscegenation laws. In other words, 40% of the people were against were 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 against um, marriage across racial lines. Right. Yeah, that, that's in in our lifetime. Not, not it just in our lifetime. It was just you know. Not yeah, that which long. like in recent history, we just have to yeah, unpack that for a moment. That we're not talking yeah. about ancient history. We're talking about no. the fact that this fight is still going on in yeah. the twenty first century in yeah. a very real real way. I want to just pivot, pivot for a little bit. I want to ask you a question. There's something that really um, um, intrigued me in the book, and it was it was the way in which force good cheer was used as a weapon of submission. You know, as someone who's in the entertainment industry and is hyper conscious of, of the way in which, you know, I portray African-American um, um, characters on stage. I'm wondering w whether you can you can just talk about how cheerful entertainers became a staple in our culture. That it was something that was very deliberate on the part yeah. of the dominant caste. Yeah, and that dates back to the time of enslavement, in which um, uh, enslaved people were um, were beaten, um, whipped if they did not um, show a a face of good cheer, even as they were being, when they were being sold, even as they were being separated from, broken from their, you know, their spouse or their children or their mother or their father, they were, they were beaten and whipped if they did not put on a good countenance of cheer, good cheer, because that could endanger or jeopardize the, the sale. And they were to be co-opted into their own degradation, co-opted into their own despair and tragedy, because each separation was obviously a tragedy. And of course, in that era, when 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 an enslaved person was separated from a spouse or a child or a parent, that meant that they would never ever see that person again. Uh, that was that was the end of it. And so these are you know you, you think about all the broken threads and all of the the tragedies that people were forced to bear and they were forced to bear it with a smile on their face. Right. Um, and that, that, that set in motion this expectation that, you know, it led to the idea of minstrelsy. It led to the idea that, um, that of the, the jolly mammy that, you know, that was happy to take care of the children uh, that, that were her in her charge, you know, the Donna Cass, even though her own children um, wherever they might have been, if they'd been sold away or if they had been, you know, she, if she could not care for them because she was charged with caring for, for the children of the dominant caste, that served to reassure and justify the, uh, the subjugation and the, uh, the traumas that, that were being inflicted on people. You know, it's, it's so interesting that you say that but because from a really early age, we're taught to, um, to absorb that trauma, bruise on the inside, you know, um, we're, we're told to turn the other cheek and it's incredibly yeah. painful. I'm just thinking when you were talking about that this past year, um, and I haven't thought about this in, in, in a while, but I, um, I was working with um, a white colla collaborator. Uh oh, there's my bell. <laughs> it's a package. Um, I, was, I was working with a, a white, white collaborator who lived just off of Central Park West. We we're working on a musical version of, of Secret Life of Bees. And I'd often go up there um, because we're working on the book and, and the lyrics together. And, and when I arrived one day, there was an older um, Latinx doorman who was sitting there. He wasn't the usual doorman. And I just normally say her name and I breeze right past and I get into the elevator and I go upstairs. And in this instance, he stopped me and he asked me what business I had in the building. I said, well, I know someone here in the building. He says, well, I don't think so. And wow. then he had the audacity to refuse to not only let me in, but he refused to call up to my friend to announce that I was there. And after we had this incredibly long, and I will confess, untidy argument, you know, he finally Calm, calm down, and I calmed down enough where I was able to call up to my collaborator. She had to come all the way downstairs. This is this is earlier this year to say this is my friend in order to let me up, you know. And you talk about how embed deeply embedded the caste system is. Yeah. This man, yeah. you know, he made the assumption that I had no business in that building if I wasn't cleaning or if I wasn't nannying, and he was right. enforcing it in ways that were so destructive you know just not to just me but to him personally and it was hurt it was annoying it was hurtful and i'm really glad to report that he was fired <laughs> okay oh, 
<laughs> you know, so there was a, 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 um, a happy ending to the story. She made a, a, for, a formal complaint. But one of the things that you talk about um, in your, your book is just how no matter what privileged positions we uh, um, can rise to as African Americans, as Black people, we still are victims of the caste system. And I'm thinking in your book, you talk about Jack Johnson and Forrest Whitaker, and um, I can't remember the NFL player's name, but you know, all these people who you know, who are recognizable and live with this this you know live with a certain level of comfort, but still the caste system rears it, its ugly head occasionally. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that is a perfect example of, of what I would call casteism, the autonomic impulse to keep people in a fixed place and an investment in upholding the, the hierarchy and policing the boundaries to protect the dominant caste from the incursion of people who are viewed as subjugated. And it's such an autonomic response. And this is the reason why I'm saying that, you know, would we say that that's actually racism? There are people who might say it's racism, but I'm saying there's something underneath that. That, that is deeply troubling and so autonomic as to be the very, the thing that really has to be addressed in our society because, you know, I describe caste as the bones and then race is the skin, meaning it's what we, you know, what we look like. And then class is the, you know, the, um, the uh, accents, the clothing, the diction, the education, the things that we can do to present ourselves in a way that um, you know, allows us to, to present ourselves as we perceive ourselves to be. And yet uh, <clears throat> we see class is the thing that allows us to actually see how caste operates because it's once you've accounted for all other factors that if a person is still being stopped, still being, uh, uh, police still being responded to in a certain way based upon the cue and the signifier of their race, then that is what is underneath all of this. I mean, I'd say that, you know, if you can act your way out of it, it's okay. class, but if you cannot act your way out of it, it's caste. And these are examples of how, you know, no matter what you do, um, there is this autonomic response yeah, and that is so deeply embedded that and it's so um, it's beneath the surface of the subconscious, and yet this is what can be the, the thing that I want to say about this is it's, it's so destructive on 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 every level because that was keeping you. This is 2020 for one thing is what I'm hearing you say. This yes. is 2020. This it's is not. This is this year. This was not ancient history. This was no, not five years ago. <laughs> but if you if you multiply that times you know, um, you know, this happening, you know, thousands of millions of times, uh, um, you know, in a given week to millions upon millions of people, then you can, you can see how, you know, this is a drain of energy, a drain of time. It can uh, distort and dis disrupt, you know, everyday transactions, people just going about their days trying to get things done. And you can imagine if you multiply this times, you know, millions of times in, in a given day or week or month, you can see how this is so destructive to the larger society because basic business gets interrupted because people are being are, are policing boundaries that they have that they have encoded and have have um, somehow um, uh, embedded into themselves. And they think that they're doing the right thing in, in that, but they're actually just so destructive. And of course, this has an impact on, on people in the subordinate, sub subjugated group, historically subjugated group, because it, you know, it affects um, health, you know, it affects, you know, the, the, the length of the telomeres. I mean, there's all this, this research that shows that these things have consequences and they affect people's lives and also the larger society, which is disrupted in it, the course of natural, in the course of business, in the course of just trying to get things done in a society, you have these disruptions that can be, that, that have uh, a value, you know, financially and, and the most important way of all in one's health and life itself. I mean, what you say is so true. And I'm just thinking back to this, this, this poor doorman is that yeah. his own built-in bias didn't really allow him to access the possibility that there was another narrative there, yeah. <laughs> you know, is that he was blinded by this caste system. It was this veil, you know, uh, it was this gauzy veil that couldn't allow him to see the reality. Yeah. And it's so unfortunate. Um, I know that we, we're, we're sort of moving um, toward the time to take questions. And there are a few questions here. And so I'm just looking in the chat, I'm reading through to see wh which, which questions to ask. Um, so the first question is, many social justice advocates view these issues 
through the lens of race. Can Ms. Wilkerson explain again, <laughs> especially to those who might resist this new paradigm, how race and caste interact? Well, again, um, caste is the infrastructure of divisions in a society, and any um, society can, can use any number of metrics in order to determine um, the value of an individual, to use as a metric um, measure of where a person is situated in the hierarchy. In our society, well, for, let me just say that there could be any number, there could be religion, it could be immigrant status, it could be, um, uh, uh, of course, skin color, it can be any number of metrics that could be used in a society. Um, religion is often a really big one in, in, in other cultures. In our culture, the metric for determining where a person fits in the underlying essential infrastructure of the hierarchy itself, and it could have been any number of things. I, even in the book, I say that it could have been height, which is also um, a, you know, largely um, a, uh, a, a trait that is 80% um, um, passed down through um, one's parentage, through one, you know, genetics. And so um, what, how tall you are is often correlated with, with others in your family. And so that could have been used as a metric where people who were very, very short could have been in charge and people who were very, very tall would have been the subjugated group or vice versa. So this is all, this is all arbitrary. Race in our society is the metrics that, that is used to decide to apportion to a fixed uh, it's the cue, it's a signifier as to where a person fits in the underlying hierarchy. And the reason why I think it's important to think about caste as, as, a, as an infrastructure that can illuminate things beyond what we think we see is because it connects us to the general human impulse to categorize and to rank anyway. It allows us to see that we actually have things in common with other societies that we can perhaps learn from if we can see what we have in common. The idea of this happen happening to be the metric in our society should not does not mean that the metric doesn't have meaning. It's just that that is merely the measure, the metric that was used in our society to rank and to, to create this arbitrary graded um, hierarchy that we've inherited. Um, can I just ask a, a related question, question? Because we know that anti-Blackness has really fueled the yeah. cat system over the last 400 years, but now we see this influx of a lot of people from Central and South American who are indigenous, who are occupying some of the jobs that were traditionally occupied by, you know, the subjugated, um, the subordinate caste. And I'm wondering, do you see any recalibration in America of the way in which the caste system is being applied? I believe that, that you know, as I was saying before, that there is a, you know, anyone new coming into this, what was, uh, created as a bipolar system has to figure out how they are going to navigate what their role, what the expected role is. So I think that this, this, the caste system that originally was bipolar gains layers. Then those layers, as other people come in, um, then po become what I describe as the middle caste, middle right. caste that are all, um, all uh, you know, basically anyone in a, in a society having to or feeling that they need to accede to whatever are the whatever is the role that is permitted, assigned, encouraged, rewarded in the caste system itself. The thing that the 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 sad um, you know tragic the tragedy uh, of, of this is that the the um, the people assigned to the very bottom, um, those who are descended from the people who've been enslaved has sadly remained as the, you know, the, the bottom up beneath which um, other groups seek not to fall. And, um, and that's what you, what you mean by anti-Blackness. Anti-Blackness right. what is the, is the underlying um, metric, which is where race and caste get, um, you know, begin to overlap. But they overlap only because the metric is having this, this group at the bottom, as in India, the bottom group is the, uh, were, were the untouchables now known as Dalits. And the, there is a connection between the having someone at the very bottom against which others measure themselves. And, and that's where anti-Blackness comes in. Um, thank, thank you for that, that clarification. Um, here's another question. You both have spoken about how in the process of developing your work, you invest in building trust with people in order to document their stories. I wonder how you can think, how you think about that in this moment when there's such a deep need for listening at the same time that there appears to be a complete lack of trust. 
any thoughts on how we bridge the divide and create the conditions for the type of listening that might enable us to actually understand one another and heal? Well, um, you know, in the epilogue of the book, um, which I, in which I'm describing myself essentially as the building inspector of the old house that we call America, the old house that we call our country. And um, I do not have, there's not a 10 point plan for overcoming this because it's so massive that it will take everyone, um, it will take, you know, ev everyone in every system within our country to, to overcome a 400 year old hierarchy that we li still live in, live under and that you can see is so deeply embedded that it's autonomic and subconscious. Um, but I do make reference to this need for what I'm describing as radical empathy, radical mm -hmm. empathy, particularly on the part of people who have not been the targets of the caste and who've not had to bear the burden and the brunt of the uh, of this caste system. In other words, those who have had the luxury of not having to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis, it's calling for radical empathy on the part of people who have been, um, who, who happen to, through no fault of their own or action of their own, to have been born to the group that has historically been um, in the dominant group. And, you know, radical empathy is different from regular empathy that we usually think of as just imagining, you know, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. And that is not sufficient in, in the current era. It's just simply not sufficient. Tolerance is not sufficient because tolerance means that you just, you tolerate that which you wish wasn't there. You know, you tolerate, you know, pebble in your shoe or mosquitoes in the summer, but you really wish that you didn't have to tolerate them. So tolerance is the very, like the very minimum that can be expected in any working society, but it's hardly the standard of, of, of how one would view other group. You know, there's no, there's no spiritual, um, tradition that says you should tolerate your neighbor as you tolerate yourself. I mean, tolerance is a very, is, 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 I, don't, I don't think that that's as helpful as we might think it to be. But radical empathy is beyond just um, imagine, you know, trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Radical empathy calls upon us to, um, to go far beyond that. In other words, it, it calls for, you know, not uh, not assuming that you know what someone else's experience might be. I mean, the problem with empathy as we often think of it is that it can be a an illusion it make it can give us the illusion that we really understand something that we really don't because we put ourselves we, we try it's more like role playing where you you i you try to imagine what you would do if you were in someone else's situation but the problem is that you might be trying to imagine yourself in a situation that you have never been in and likely never will be. And that's why radical empathy calls upon people to be willing to do the work um, with a, you know, an, a, a willing heart and an open mind to listen and to hear and to learn and to do the research and to, to learn the history, to begin to understand what other people um, are experiencing people who have who have had to bear the brunt of something that you you have been had the luxury of not having to think about and to really put yourself in a sense of listening and learning with a humble heart to be able to truly understand what someone else may have experienced so that you look at it not from a perspective of what you think you would do in a situation you've never been in and never will be, but what that person has truly lived and experienced, endured, suffered, whatever it may be from their perspective. Because I often say that, you know, when people ask, why do those people do this particular thing? Like, why do those people do this or do that? There's only one answer to that question from my perspective. And the answer is, what do human beings do? in that circumstance. What do human beings do in that circumstance? Human beings have to find a way to survive in whatever situ situation that they're in. So how are they responding to a particular phenomenon? If you've not had to deal with that phenomenon and you, it, it is of no, it is less helpful than we might think to try to imagine what you would do in a phenomenon that you never had to experience. So it means learning what the phenomenon is, learning the history, listening and hearing with an open heart and a willing mind to what someone else's lived experience has been. And I think that's the very minimum that our era calls for. And that's so beautiful. And you, you, you um, I, I love that notion of radical em empathy, active listening. And if I may just add one more ingredient, which is replacing judgment with curiosity and leading with an open heart. Um, which is the way that I, I do all of my work. And there's there's one one more 
uh, well, actually, the two more questions here. Um, one question would be, would I would love to hear about Ms. Wilkerson's research into India and their traditional caste system. Yeah, well, you know, that was the first place that I went. I mean, the under the uh, subtext of this book is the origins of our discontents. That's the subtitle. And I want to emphasize that this book is about America. It's about us, and it's about what we can learn from other cultures. And you know, uh, one of the you know the the, the uh, you know that meant going to the original caste system of, of South Asia, particularly India, and to try to understand how that worked, and with a special eye toward the psychology uh, of that caste system. What was the effect on the various people based upon where they were located in that caste system? And more particularly, what were the hallmarks, the characteristics that um, that I could learn from and that I could, you know, ended up doing all this research to come up with these eight pillars that I, uh, you know, ascertained um, and wrote as the hallmarks, the, the main, you know, examples of how um, of characteristics of a caste system. And so, of course, the Indian caste system is an extremely complex one. It's millennia old. Um, it is essentially a four main varnas of the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas of the Advaisyas and the Shudras. And then, and then beyond all of them are the, um, the, the outcasts, the, um, the, the, what were known as the untouchables and now known as Dalits. And, you know, when Martin Luther King made his historic trip to India, um, in 1959, it turned out that the what, what the people who were then known as untouchables identified with him, and they considered him to be an American untouchable. And he actually resisted that term when he first heard it. He he didn't it, it didn't sit well with him. And yet, then he thought about it. he thought about the people back in the United States that he was advocating for 20 million people who were being excluded from you know from uh, public accommodations, excluded from voting, and so many other things. And that their efforts to to uh, to gain um, you know human rights, civil rights in this country were was were met with uh, with resistance and violence. And so he he came to the realization that yes, I am and uh, and I'm an untouchable, and every black person in the United States is an untouchable. So this was the connection that was made by people who were then known as untouchables, the Dalits made that connection for him. And thus he made, came to the recognition that that actually was an appropriate um, parallel for understanding our country. They're very, very different, of course, in many, many ways. But I wanna say one thing that was, that's consistent across, uh, across um, caste systems is the idea of endogamy, which means that you cannot cross uh, caste lines in order to marry, which of course the United States had for most of its history. And then also this idea of purity versus pollution, meaning keeping the dominant caste pure at all costs from the presumed pollution that would come from proximity to or interaction with those who were deemed um, as a subordinated caste. And in India, for example, each, each society has different ways of, of policing or setting the boundaries for that. And um, among certain of the of the subordinated castes in India, they were to remain as many as 96 paces away from someone who was a dominant group. Um, in the United States, of course, as I described, you know, the, the Bible could not be touched by hands of different races. Um, but also, the thing that was more common was this recognition, uh, this autonomic across oceans and across cultures and across centuries, even the idea that water, the sacred element of you know life itself on this planet, had to be protected and kept pure from the subordinated groups so that, you know, that they, so that uh, untouchable people could not, you know, draw water from the same well. There was tremendous res uh, uh, restrictions on what they could do when it came to water. And in our country, there were tremendous restrictions on African-Americans not being able to use pools um, that were used by uh, people of the dominant group. They're restricted from being able to do, they're restricted from uh, the beaches, restricted from the waters of, of, of the country itself. And you know, it came to a tragic end in, um, in Chicago um, in, in the early 20th century where a young boy, a boy was swimming in Lake Michigan and he happened to have waded into what was considered to be the white water. Now, of course, the white water looked the same as the black water. You know, if you buy into the even distinctions such as that, um, Lake Michigan looks the same no matter who happens to be in it. But he had waded into what was viewed as the white water, and he was stoned to death for having done so, setting off um, uh, one of the the biggest um, uh, race um, 
uh, uh, riots in in um, in American history, in which many many um, people on uh, both races, but primarily African Americans, who were under attack, um, uh, perished. And so this is these are examples of the points of intersection that that I um, came to recognize in the course of the research. No, that's a, that's a, a, incredible. Um, and we had spoken before about an incident in which my father, who didn't know how to swim and had never learned because he was an African-American man of a certain ge generation, a black man, and he and my daughter almost drowned and they were pulled out of the water by people at the beach. And he, and I remember how helpless he felt and, and how he was sobbing when he pulled out of the water. And, and, and just hearing you speak, I was just thinking in that moment, I felt really angry and judgmental of him. Um, but reading your book really helped me personally understand that he didn't know how to swim, not because of uh, lack of will, but because of lack of access. And because for nearly a century, like you said, black people were denied access to water, to beaches, to swimming pools, to, lake, to, to lakes. And it's really important for us to understand and hear that um, um, periodically. Um, I think that we're running out of time. Is there one last question is, um, I'd love to know if, if um, Ms. Wilkerson sees a redefinition or a shift in how we define who is black or white happening now, especially during this time of reckoning with structural racism and police violence. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that we have inherited these designations and you know, was, what do we do once we recognize that these truly are social constructs that have no basis in biology or science that have been given meaning and thus now have meaning because they do have consequences. There's, there's no way that we can pretend that the designations have not had such a long history that they affect um, the life chances of any of, of everyone on the basis of how they're perceived to be. And yet I would hope that, you know, the United States it has been has a history also of being um, an innovator, of being creative, of you know technology and the uh, export of the creativity uh, that is part of what you know what it means to be American. Uh, that it views itself as being um, uh, as being distinct and and being exceptional. And one would hope that if that truly is the creed, if that's truly what the United States sees itself, that perhaps the United States could be the one, could be the culture and the society that finds a way to transcend these artificial barriers and to show the world how to overcome and transcend caste itself. That would be the challenge for, for us in our time and for in this, in this country, for the good, not just of our communities and of our country, but, but actually the species and the planet. Well, I, I just wanna thank you, Isabel, for your brilliance, for your generosity, for um, unpacking all of these ideas in a way that really has driven them home. But and I, I want to just leave by offering this to everyone who's out there: is that radical, radical empathy, uh, radical em empathy, um, really should be a philosophy that we all embrace. It should be a spiritual practice. It should be a cultural practice. Can you just imagine what the world will be like if we led with that? You know, and particularly as we're welcoming like um, um, a new president and vice president into office, you know, I wonder if there's a way that we can get your book into their hands <laughs> um, and, and that they read it. Um, bef you know, before they are sworn in, so they understand that there has to be this this radical shift in the way, and not just they lead, but in the way in which they think about race and caste system in America. I don't know whether you have anything to uh, to, to leave us with. No, I love what you just said, and I, I agree completely, and I hope that we find a way to transcend these barriers, and we have a lot of work ahead of ourselves, but, you know, you cannot... Um, heal from what has not been diagnosed and you can't fix what you can't see. And this is all a way to help us to be able to see what we couldn't see before. And I hope that we can make use of this in order to, to heal and to move forward. And so thank you. And um, I'll just hop in to say thank you both so much for this truly incisive and resonant discussion. Um, it's been such an honor to host this discussion. And I know I'm so grateful for your reflections and wisdom as I'm sure everyone tuning in is as well. Um, as one final reminder, if you haven't already engaged with these incredible texts, um, in particular cast, you can purchase um, 
the book for a 15% discount, a signed copy um, through the link that's in the chat. And you can also purchase um, Lynn's not Lynn Nottage's work there as well as the warmth of other sons. Um, but with that, I'm just gonna say thank you both again. And thanks again to all of you joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.